myself on mute too. Okay, cool. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to go page by page almost through the troubleshooting book. Um, with regard to the kind of information that we're going to actually highlight and read and go over and what have you, this, these are things that, um, you know, as I've taught this class over the past 15 years, get a lot of feedback from students, you know, possible students that didn't pass and, and you know, and they've got, uh, they've got some, some issues that they pointed out that, that were important to them. And, um, and then just also just, uh, just experience as well as, as, you know, knowing the kind of questions that they're going to ask. So on the exam. So um, we will, uh, we will, um, like I said, uh, just start at the beginning, go to the end. We already talked in the, in the uh, beginning, um, uh, in the introduction about the index being really good. We talked about the safety procedure section. We talked about the troubleshooting section and we talked about the index uh, not the index, but the table of contents and how just, you know, every couple of pages, there's a reference in the table of contents because of it being the nature of the book being a troubleshooting book. Um, you know, that it doesn't take too long to talk about each particular issue. You're not explaining large concepts. You're, you're explaining specific issues. So think about that when you're using that table of contents to find information. Okay. So the first thing that we're going to, you know, uh, they do, uh, discuss wiring. All right. Wiring is a big deal, obviously, as, as part of, you know, this, uh, you know, this business. So number on page five, um, this is paragraph at the bottom, the four, uh, uh, four dash two C. Okay. Grounded compressor motor wires. Okay. And in the third to the last line, it says a grounded winding will be indicated by a low resistance reading. All right. So that's what you really want to know. All right. While we're here, um, let's look, let's back up just uh, let's just let's let's back up just a little bit to page four. We're going to talk about open compressor. This is the last paragraph on, on page four, four dash two a open compressor motor windings occur when the path for electrical current is interrupted. Interruption occurs when the insulation uh, wire becomes bad and allows the wire to overheat and, and burn apart. To check for an open winding, remove all external wiring from the motors, use the, oh, uh, the ohmmeter, check the co continuity from one terminal to another terminal, be sure to zero the ohmmeter. The open winding will be indicated by an infinity resistance. There you go. That's what you need to know. Okay. On the next paragraph, 4-2B, we're talking about a shorted compressor motor winding. Okay, when there's a short, if you if you um, go ahead and skip down to the fourth to the last line, it says a shorted, the shorted winding will be indicated by a less than normal resistance. So these are all things that you're gonna have to be, you know, be able to find, you know, when you're taking your exam. All right, so let's go to, we're gonna skip over to page seven. All right, uh, top, of, uh, top of page seven, the first paragraph is 4-2D. And it says, we're gonna to try to determine the common, the run and the start terminals of a compressor. It says it's a simple process, okay? So once again, you zero the ohmmeter, uh, record the resistance found on, on the diagram, apply the following formula. The least resistance, is between the run and the common. The medium resistance is between the common and the start. The most resistance is between the start and the run, all right? Um, if that's the case, the, comp uh, the comp uh, compressor motor should now be properly wired. So that's what you wanna, that's what you wanna know there. So a little bit about wiring, okay? They go into, we're not gonna highlight much, but they go into a three terminal type to get a question about that on page nine. They have a four terminal type external compressor motor overload um, on uh, on page 10. We don't really um, like so we don't highlight that, but just in case you get that, you want to want to look, you want to you know know where it's at. Um, bottom of page 11, hydraulic fluid type compressor motor. Okay, so um, we are going to We're going to jump over to page, oh, flipping too many here, uh, 
I want you to be on page uh, 19 at the top. There is a suction line accumulator in installation. Okay. So basically, um, between you, this diagram is going to help you, is going to help you figure out exactly where this suction line accumulator needs to be. All right. It needs to be between the compressor and the evaporator. That's basically what that diagram is telling you about where the suction line accumulator has to be. All right. And then um, on, if you back up just a page um, to um, 18, section 4-4, compressor slugging. We're told that slugging is a noisy condition that occurs when the compressor is pumping oil or liquid refrigerant. Okay. So you might need to know what slugging means. All right. Uh, we go to page 22, and there are some oil failure controls. Okay. Um, we read in paragraph 7 1 that oil failure controls used to protect the compressor from improper lubrication. The control is actuated by the difference in pressure between the oil pump outlet and the crankcase pressure. A time delay switch allows the oil pressure to build up to preset operating pressure on compressor start and also prevents nuisance shutdown of the compressor if the oil pressure drops for a short time. Okay, so you get a kind of an idea of what's in this book here. All right, now at the bottom of that page, bottom of that same page, they talk about a thermostat. All right, so we're, we're going to be checking a thermostat. Tells us what a thermostat is. We all know what a thermostat is. But as, if, if, if we, we want to check to see if the thermostat is working correctly. All right. And basically, it says it starts at the bottom of the page to check the thermostat, turn it below room temperature. And we flip the page, place a reliable thermometer as close to the thermostat as possible. Now, you're going to want to allow the thermometer to remain there, remain there for 10 minutes. All right. There you go. So that's what you want to do. And then you're going to turn the thermostat temperature selector up. Contact should make. They should close at no more than two degrees above the temperature indicated by the thermometer. OK, if not, it's got to be calibrated. There we go. All right. So we're going to go to page 26. And at the bottom of the page, there is paragraph 8-E1. E, uh, excuse me, A-1E, refrigeration thermostats generally make use of a fluid-filled bulb sensing element, okay? And then we skip about four lines and we're told to check for a faulty thermostat, all right? So this is a refrigeration thermostat. To check for a faulty thermostat, place a reliable thermometer as close to the sensing element. And once again, it's 10 minutes and then it's the two degrees as well. Okay, very good. All right. Um, let's do something. Let's take a look at the top. Um, you've got a, uh, you've got a uh, voltmeter there. Okay. And it says we're going to wire the voltmeter. Okay, this is checking amperage. So this is a diagram at the top of page 26. We're going to be checking the amperage, amperage in the temperature control unit. All right. So we, 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 we put our wire around our sensor four times. All right. It reads 1.6 amps. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do the math. We're going to divide it. It's going to be 0.4 amps. So we're going to set our heat anticipator to 0.4. So that's the way you do that math. So we're going to jump over to page 22 and we're going to uh, discuss some oil failure controls here. Um, oil failure controls used to protect the compressor from improper lubrication. The control is actually by the difference between the oil pump outlet and the crankcase pressure. We just do that. We just did that. Sorry. Okay. We will go to page uh 29 we're talking about pressure controls here and we're talking about a low pressure control on page 29 which uh which is paragraph 9-1a low pressure controls are designed to respond to the refrigerant pressure in the low in the low side of the system they will stop the compressor to protect it from overheating prevent the 
from pumping oil out of the crankcase. The smaller units, the low pressure control may be used as a temperature control. All right, there we go. We skip, a, we go to the next paragraph. We're talking about high pressure controls. Um, they will stop the compressor motor protector from being overloaded due to excessive pressure. To check a high pressure control, install a pressure gauge on the compressor discharge service valve. All right, there you go. Gives you a little procedure right there. We're going to take a look at capacitors. All right, um, halfway down the page, we're going to we're going to be checking this capacitors. All right, first of all, 13-1A, we all probably know the starting capacitors are used in the starting circuit of a motor. They're generally round in case in, plas in uh, plastic casing, have a relatively high microfarad MFD rating, okay? And those are designed for short periods of use only. Prolonged use will usually result in damage to the capacitor. Starting capacitor is found to be defective. Be sure to check the starting relay before the unit is placed back in service, or the new capacitor may also be damaged. Check the best way to check a capacitor is by use of a capacitor analyzer. Okay, so that's what you need to know there. We skip a paragraph, we skip a couple of pages to page 35, uh, second paragraph, paragraph 14-1A. The amperage circuit relay is an electromagnetic type relay, which is normally used on half horsepower units and smaller. These relays are positional types. Okay, they must be properly mounted for satisfactory operation. We're talking about starting relays here. All right. Now you have on the next page, on page 36, paragraph 14-1B, which is a solid state starting relay. All right. Um, <clears throat> use self-regulating conductive ceramic developed by Texas Instruments, which increases uh, electrical resistance to the compressor starts, thus quickly reducing the starting winding current flow to a milliamp level. The relay switches in approximately 0.35 seconds. This allows the type of relay to be applied, this type of relay to be applied to the refrigerator compressors without being tailored for each particular system. Okay, these relays, this is what's key here, will start virtually all split phase, 115 volt hermetic compressors up to a third of a horsepower. All right, you gotta use an overlap, those two are told. Okay, so there we go. All right, we're gonna keep cruising through here on page 40, high discharge pressure. Top of page 40, paragraph 18, or section 18.1. High uh, discharge pressure can be the result of one or a combination of several things. It is a condition that causes an overload on the motor and decreases the efficiency of the compressor in the refrigeration system. The most common causes are Compressor discharge service front valve front seated. All right. Lack of cooling air, lack of cooling water, and overcharge of refrigerant or non condensable gases. All right. Now you're going to see this diagram lots of places at the bottom of page 40. This is one inch deflection. All right. So we see that question come up a lot, and we see it in a lot of places in, the, in this book and many other, in other books. One inch deflection on your belt is, is, is what your is the proper tension. We're going to see some more information about uh, what happens when your when your belt is too tight uh, at a later later point. Okay, uh, we're on page 41. We're talking we're in paragraph 18-1C. We're talking about the lack of cooling water. All right. The lack of cooling water in a water cool condenser will cause the discharge pressure to increase because the high pressure is required to condense the vapor to a liquid. The higher refrigerant temperature also reduces unit efficiency because the increased flash gas, as well as reducing uh, compressor efficiency. This, this condition is generally caused by plugged strainers, pumps, or spray nozzles. When this condition is suspected, check the temperature rise of the water through the condenser. This rise should not be more than 10 degrees Fahrenheit. All right. If that's the case, then you've got a strainer pump spray nozzle stopped up or it's not enough water. All right. A temperature rise of water less than 10 degrees indicates the condenser is scaled and must be cleaned. All right. So there you go. A couple of issues there. A water-cooled condenser. All right. Paragraph, excuse me, page 44, um, paragraph 18-1F. 
the overcharge of refrigerant causes a high discharge pressure because the extra refrigerant will take up space in the condenser that is needed to condense the vapor to a liquid. An overcharge of refrigerant will cause at least one half of the condenser tubes to be cooler than the rest. The cool tubes are the ones that are full of liquid refrigerant. Okay. Um, when a capillary tube is used, the suction pressure will also be higher than normal. The suction line will also be cooler than normal and may be frosted over, depending on the amount of overcharge. So all those things um, are caused by an overcharge of refrigerant. On page 49, we're going to discuss the thermostatic expansion valve. All right. Uh, most common type of flow control devices on five ton units and above. They operate as a result of pressure and temperature inside the evaporator. The proper superheat adjustment of these valves will have a tremendous effect on the efficiency of the equipment. A thermostatic expansion valve that is adjusted for too great a superheat or an improperly located feeler bub will result in a low suction pressure. If the superheat is found to be improperly adjusted, it may be adjusted by the following procedure. And it kind of gives you all those procedures right there. I'm not going to read all those, but you can uh, check out. Those are the procedures of adjusting a thermostatic expansion valve. Okay. Now, in the next couple of pages, there is... Um, there's a table, okay? This may not be the definitive table that you're gonna use when you're, uh, um, when you're figuring this out. Um, it's actually, yeah, it's uh, basically there is a relationship between the temperature and the pressure of a particular refrigerant. And it's the simplest question in the world to answer. You, all you have to do is figure out, you find your table. Now, now we have a new book called Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Technology. This is that's going to have all these other tables with the most with the most updated refrigerants. But you can also get that information here. And basically, all you have to do is just know the refrigerant. They're going to give you the refrigerant on the question. They're going to give you the either the pressure or the temperature, and you're going to have to pull the other one off the chart. Okay, so it's like these are constant numbers, you know. Um, so uh, make sure that you can uh, make sure that you can you can locate those. Okay. Um, we're told on page fifty-two that figure one sixty-eight, and you can look there at the bottom if you like. Um, illustrates a typical example of superheat superheat measurement on air conditioning system using R twelve. The temperature of the suction line. The temperature of the suction line at the bulb location is read at 51 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so this might be a little bit of a math question here. All right, so we're figuring superheat here. The temperature of the suction line at the bulb is 51. The suction pressure at the compressor suction valve is 35, and the estimated pressure drop is 2 psi. The total suction pressure is 35 psi plus 2 equals 37, all right, PSI. This is equivalent to a 40 degree saturation temperature, all right? Then 40 degrees is subtracted from 51 equals 11 superheat setting. Wow, that's a long way to go for that. Okay, so let's look at that again. So they're telling us, okay, that the temperature is 51, okay, the suction line. The suction pressure at the compressor is 35, all right? The estimated pressure drop is two, so the total suction pressure, so 35 is, is suction, so we add 35 and two and we get 37, all right? Now the equivalent to a 40, uh, this is equivalent to a 40 degree Fahrenheit saturation temperature. Now let's see if they get that off the table, okay? So we've got R12, and we have 37 PSI. So let's back up. We got R12. Okay. 37. 37 PSI. Okay. 36.9. Ah, look at the table there. Okay. So we have to go to the table now. 
So I'm, I backed up a page, all right? I backed up a page. I went to R12. There's our table right there. Yep. We go to R12. This is what I was telling you before. You go to R12. You go down to where it says 37. Well, that's pretty damn I'm close, 36.9, right? We go over and we see that 40 degrees is, is what we take off the table. All right, so we take 40 off the table, but then we go back and we say, okay, well, it was actually the temperature, the suction line of the bulb was actually 51, okay? The number off the table is 40, so we take the difference between the two, and that's how we get the superheat. Yeah, you know, not the most complicated thing in the world, but it is nice to have somebody kind of walk you through that. All right, so we're talking, if we keep going down that same page, we're talking about a feeler bulb on a thermostatic expansion valve, okay, is one of the major forces controlling the valve. If the bulb is located in a cold location, it will cause the valve to starve the evaporator, causing a lower than normal suction. Location of the feeler bulb is extremely important. In some cases, it determines the success or failure of the refrigeration plant. Satisfactory expansion valve control, good thermal contact between the bulb and the suction line is essential. The bulb should, should be securely fastened with two bulb straps to a clean, straight section of the suction line. Okay, installation of the bulb on a horizontal run is, is preferred. If vertical installation cannot be avoided, the bulb should be mounted so that the capillary tubing comes from the top. All right, as we go... Uh, let's, let's just keep reading there. To install, clean the suction line thoroughly before clamping the remote bulb in place. When a steel suction line is used, it is advisable to paint the line with aluminum paint to minimize future corrosion, eliminate any fault or remote bulb contact with the line. Long lines under seven eighths of an inch OD, the remote bulb may be installed on top of the line. On seven eighths, in, that's on lines under seven eighths. On line seven eighths and larger, the remote bulb should be installed at about the four or eight o'clock position. Okay. When a next paragraph, uh, when a thermostat expansion valve is stuck open, there will be an excessive amount of sweating on the suction line. All right. That. We're going to skip a couple of pages over to page 57. Okay. Section 22 is all about, uh, is all about, um, 22 is restriction in a refrigeration circuit. So we're going to go to 57 and highlight 22-1E, ice in the orifice of a refrigerant flow control device is due to free moisture in the system. Okay, so ice is due in, in a refrigerant flow control device is due to free moisture in the system. Okay, here we go. We're gonna go to page 59 and we're going to highlight on paragraph 24-1C when the refrigerant velocity is too low, the re, in the refrigerant lines, the oil will not be returned to the compressor properly. Okay, we're going to talk about uh, some information on 62, evaporator too small. In a 30-1 is the paragraph number. In a properly designed and installed system, the evaporator will be of the correct size. However, sometimes in a service technician, sometimes a service technician will find a defective coil and replace it with one that is too small. The only step required is to replace the evaporator with one of the proper size. An evaporator that is too small will cause a lower than normal suction pressure with probable frosting of the evaporator. Okay. Next paragraph, liquid flashing. Liquid flashing or turning to vapor in the liquid line may be due to a shortage of refrigerant. A liquid line that is too small or a liquid line that has too high vertical lift or a liquid line, Li liquid flashing will be indicated by a hissing or gurgling noise at the expansion valve and a lower than normal suction pressure. 
Okay. Uh, we're going to go to the bottom of page 63, 31-1C. When liquid lines extend vertically for more than approximately 20 feet, the weight of the liquid forcing downward will probably cause flash gas. This flash gas is due to the drop in pressure. All right, let's skip a couple lines. This pressure difference plus the heat in the liquid will cause the flash gas. When this condition is encountered, a lower than normal suction pressure and a reduction in the pressure temperature of the liquid line near the evaporator will be present. To solve this problem, the liquid refrigerant must be subcooled. This must be accomplished by installing another condenser coil in the liquid line near the condenser outlet, or in severe cases, a suction to liquid heat exchanger should be added to the system. Okay, there we go. All right. We're going to uh, pick up on page 69, paragraph 37 1b. An overcharge of refrigerant will cause both the suction and the discharge pressure to be higher than normal. Okay, very good. We go to moisture in the system on page 71. Moisture that has entered the system can cause many serious problems. The most obvious is freezing of the moisture in the flow control orifice. Other more serious problems due to moisture in a refrigeration system are acid forming and sludging of the compressor lubricating oil. Next paragraph, moisture freezing in the refrigerant flow control orifice will result in poor refrigeration accompanied by lower than normal suction pressure and possibly a lower than normal discharge pressure. Okay, okay. We're going to talk on page 73 about at the bottom, paragraph 39-1D as in David, um, about the defrost termination point. All right, this is the temperature at which the defrost period ends. When this point is too low, a sufficient a amount of frost or ice will not be removed from the coil to allow proper refrigeration to occur. Okay, the temperature is determined by setting, by the setting on the defrost control and accumulation of frost buildup on the coil is an indication of a too low termination point. All right. On the next page, on page 74, paragraph 39-1E, when the hot gas type of defrost is involved, a solenoid valve is used to direct the flow of hot gas around the flow control device and into the evaporator. Got a solenoid valve there. All right. As we go to page 79, at the bottom of the page, we're talking about a defrost limiter here. The defrost limiter is a temperature sensing device that terminates the defrost period when the evaporator temperature reaches approximately 50 degrees. A faulty one will limit, uh, will allow the unit to stay in defrost and will increase the inside cabinet temperature. All right. All right, so we're gonna be talking on 84 and 85 about electric motors. All right, so. You have at the uh, first paragraph, 47-1, you have a split phase. And in, in that paragraph, the, it talks about the different types. Split phase, permanent split, capacitor, capacitor start, capacitor start, capacitor is shaded pole. Okay, the amount of starting and running torque required to do the job will return turn the type, determine the type of motor to be used. All right. So once again, we're talking about open motor windings on 47.1a and how you do that, okay? Once again, if we drop down to the third line from the bottom of that paragraph, an open winding will be indicated by infinity, all right? A shorted in the next paragraph, if we drop down towards the bottom of the paragraph, the shorted winding will be indicated by less than normal resistance. We've seen this before. And then we have the grounded on the next page, and that's a low resistance reading. That's paragraph 47-1C. And it kind of shows you these, uh, these, these diagrams here, okay? The uh, interesting thing about this O-meter is that they have on, the, on, on these diagrams is when the, when the needle is to the right, that's low. And when, it, you know, when you've got high, it, uh, it moves to the left. 
which may be a little counterintuitive for you. So if you're, if you're using those diagrams, be aware of that. Okay. We're gonna go to page, uh, see, 89. Once again, it's the same diagram that we talked about before. Okay, we're checking the amperage in a temperature control circuit. We're gonna wind, we, 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 if, if, if our wire is wound, uh, uh, wound around our ammeter four times, it reads 1.6, it's just a matter of doing the division. 1.6 divided by four is 0.4 amps. So we would set, the heat anticipator to 0.4 amps. All right, pretty simple little calculation on test on exam day. All right, a lot of stuff about heating through here. We are going to jump over to page 113, and there's a discussion of a pressure regulator. So if we're working with natural gas at the bottom of page 113, natural gas furnaces are designed to operate with three and a half to four inch water column pressure. Okay. LP, all right, liquid petroleum furnaces with 11 inch water column pressure. So I wanna make sure you find the difference, uh, note the difference there. We're going to go to our reversing valve. We're going to talk about a reversing valve on page uh, 128. 92-1, the purpose of the reversing valve is to reverse the refrigerant direction on a heat pump and reverse cycle refrigeration systems. Some systems energize the coil on heating and some energize the coil on cooling. Therefore, the system in question will determine the energized condition of the coil. Any troubles that occur in a heat pump system, which will affect the normal operating pressures, could possibly affect the proper shifting of the valve. Okay, some example problems are a refrigerant leak, compressor does not operate in full capacity, defective check valve, damage valve, or defective electrical system. All right, any of those can affect the operation of the reversing valve. We're going to talk about defrost controls again on page 131, paragraph 93-1. All right. Heat pump defrost controls are used to detect ice and frost on the outdoor coil during the heating cycle. All right. Let's go to... Let's jump over to page 137, your primary control. All right, so we're talking about uh, heating here. We're talking about gas heating. We have something called a primary control on page 102-1. The purpose of the primary control is to control the operation of the oil burner and the ignition procedure. Hmm. Okay. We're going to jump over to page 151. We're talking about a dirty filter, probably the most common issue, correct? 120-1, the purpose of the filter is to remove dirt. We know that. Okay. Um, last paragraph in that, sent in that, par in that uh, section, 120-1. During the cooling season, a clogged filter will slow the airflow, lowering, lowering the suction pressure and reducing the cooling process. The unit will eventually begin to operate poorly. The customer will realize there's a problem. Okay. When air has been bypassing the filter, collecting on the blower, the evaporator coil, blower motor, and the system causing the system to operate to reduce capacity and increase cost, increase cost, the system must be cleaned and a new tight-fitting filter installed. There you go. How many times have you done that? All right, let's see here. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna jump over to page. Hmm. A couple of things on page 160 that um, were kind of interesting. Room temperature seems hotter than the thermostat setting, 138-1, okay. Um, 138-1A, if a thermostat's installed on a cold or cold wall, okay, that could be an issue. Air coming through the wall, next paragraph. Solar effect could be an issue. 
if your thermostat's too close to a to a window or a door. All right. Um, so some interesting stuff there. See, yeah. We will be going to page 186 and 187. Just in case you get a question about one of these, it's 166-1 on the bottom of page 186, a positive temperature coefficient relay, PTCR. It tells you here how it operates. It says, um, it's operates similar to a motor, motor starting capacitor, okay? The solid state device improves the starting ability of the PSC motor by temporarily causing an increase in the current supplied, okay? Just like a capacitor. When the voltage is initially applied, the PTCR immediately starts heating up because the current draw through the solid state medium inside the PTCR, uh, because of this buildup, the solid state material changes from a very low resistance to a very high resistance. When in the heated condition, it essentially becomes a non-conductive control. Okay, so that's a PTCR, should you get a question about that. Okay, all right, page 251, startup procedures. So this is, these are your startup procedures for gas. Here they all are. Okay, I'm not gonna go on uh, uh, item by item, but here they are. You have your startup on the next page for a refrigeration system. When you start it up, once again, you see our fan belt at the top of the page on page 252, three with that uh, one inch deflection. Starting up a heat pump at the bottom of 253. Electric heat on page 254. You're starting up an oil burner on 255. Okay. All right, so uh, section four begins on page 257, and this is standard service procedures. All right, so we'll talk about some standard service procedures here. Um, it does say there is a section on uh, procedure for placing a compressor. All right. Section 1.1 on page 260. Past experiences have demonstrated that after a hermetic motor burns out and has occurred, the refrigerator system must be cleaned to remove all contaminants. Without removal of these contaminants, a repeat will occur, burnout. Failure will follow these uh, minimum cleaning recommendations as quickly as possible will result in excess of risk of uh, repair, re repeat burnout. Cleaning of the system by flushing with refrigerant R11 or similar has been used in the past under certain conditions with mixed degrees of success. This flushing method is seldom used today, is not recommended. First step is to be certain the compressor is burned. The following list is generally, is a general procedure used. So this is what you do to make sure that you're, uh, that the compressor is definitely burned out. Okay, on page 262, we're gonna uh, discuss procedure for using your gauge manifold, paragraph 2-1, section 2-1, the second paragraph there. The gauge manifold is a is set consists of three things, a compound gauge, a pressure gauge, and a manifold. <clears throat> okay. Um, and then um, if we go to the last little paragraph on the page, on systems where it is certain that both pressures are above zero, use the following, pressure, uh, following procedures. And the first thing is you front seat uh, the valves on the gauge manifold. All right, so there's your system, there's your procedure for using the gap, using the, uh, the gauge manifold. All right. And then we've got leak testing procedure on page 269, procedure for leak testing. All right. And also procedure for pumping a system out. So I would make sure that you can find both of those, okay? Not gonna go into a, a detailed explanation, detailed reading those particular pair, uh, 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 items, but uh, you're gonna wanna be able to find those for the exam. So we're talking about pumping a system out and then we're talking about leak testing as well on the same page um, or on the next page. Same thing with 
page 273, procedure for charging a refrigerant into a system. Okay, it's got a step-by-step -step process. Make sure you can find that. Okay, page uh, 275, procedure for determining the proper refrigerant charge. Same thing. It's got 11 items. I'm not going to read them to you, but if you get a test question, there they are. You can find them. Um, once again, you have the table on page 279 and 280, which is something that we've seen before, which discusses the temperature pressure relationship in the various refrigerants. I'm not sure why they show us, they give that to us again, but there they do. Okay, so lots of different procedures. Um, 282. Determining the compressor oil level, 283, adding oil, 285, loading um, a charging cylinder, uh, 287, checking uh, compressor electrical systems, and so forth. All right. 301, checking your thermostatic expansion valve. All right. All right. Under, under checking thermostat expansion valves on page 301 at the bottom, it says the following headings group suggest the possibilities of trouble indicated by the gauge and superheat readings. So low, low, suction pressure, low suction pressure and high superheat, I mean the expansion valve limiting flow is limiting flow, okay. In the, in the pressure too low and so forth, okay. On page 303, low suction, low suction pressure, low superheat, and you've got the issues that could be causing that. And then you've got high suction pressure, high superheat, high suction pressure, low, and all the different situations that you could have that are um, associated with your thermostatic expansion valve. Fluctuating suction pressure on the bottom of 303, 305 fluctuating discharge and then high discharge also on 305. So all these issues that you could have, all these situations with regard to your thermostatic expansion valve. Okay, 306, procedure for torch brazing is where we begin. So it tells you all, all everything you, you need to know about doing some torch brazing. Okay, it does give you a definition on page 306 of it says brazing is the application of heat above temperature above a temperature of 800 degrees. Okay. Um, the last paragraph, it says in order for bonding and distribution by capillary action to occur, the filler metal must be able to wet the base materials. Wetting is the phenomenon in which the forces of attraction between the molecules of the molten filler metal and the molecules of the base metals are greater than the inward forces of attraction existing between the molecules of the filler metal. Okay. All right. That's going to cause you to do braze correctly. Okay. And there's some pre procedures there. Bottom page 307, copper to copper. Okay. You're going to use phos copper bearing alloys. Okay. Uh, the next page, uh, 308, there's a discussion of as some clearance there, what your clearance is going to be between uh, two pipes that you're, uh, that you're, uh, the tubing that you're brazing there. It says between a thousandths and five thousandths clearance. All right. There is some diagrams there which uh, discuss you know, what the issues can be. You have one, you know, you have one pipe that's hot enough, one that's not and so forth. So make sure that you can find these issues. And um, on page 311, this is one that comes up a lot. When you are right in the middle of the page, well, about a third of the way down the page, when you are brazing steel to steel, and this doesn't, they don't do a really good job of explaining this, but this is steel to steel or steel to copper or steel to brass or steel to bronze. Okay, any of those situations, you're going to use a silver brazing alloy. All right, that is the issue there. Okay, don't spend a lot of time in these wiring diagrams. 
can't hardly see some of these wiring diagrams. All right. And um, we're going to jump over to 344, the importance of belt, uh, correct belt tension and alignment. We've seen the one inch deflection several times, and you're pretty much going to get that question. You shouldn't even take you any time to answer that because you don't even need to look that up at this point. All right. But in the middle of that second paragraph, it says too little deflection okay, on that belt indicates excessive tension. OK, and it's going to lead to a noisy blower operation, premature bearing failure and decreased belt life. Bearings and shafting have failed simply because excessive belt tension destroyed the oil film between the bearing and the shaft. All right. And then we're also told that figure six shows the recommended method of checking belt and drive alignment. Alignment is equal in importance to tension from both wear and quiet operation considerations. The straight edge, the straight edge must touch at four points to shown to assure good alignment. And you can kind of show what they're, uh, they're saying at that bottom right diagram there. You've got uh, if all those if all those line up, four points you have to touch there. It says in order to get proper alignment. Okay. We're going to talk a little bit about capacitors on page 362. Okay, you might have to do a little bit of math. And this is something that um, is uh, probably doesn't come naturally. We are looking, uh, let's just read what it says parallel or series capacitor connections. Let's, let's back up just a little bit. Um, just want to give a little on page 361, it gives a little bit of background on start capacitors, capacitor voltage, and so forth. So you might want to take a look at that. Um, if we look under capacitor voltage, it says the voltage rating of a capacitor indicates the normal voltage or indicates the nominal voltage at which it is designed to operate. The capacitor at voltages below its rating will do no harm, capacitors must not be subjected to voltages exceeding 110% of the nominal rating, and start capacitors must not be subject to voltages uh, exceeding 130% of the nominal rating. Okay, so we're looking at um, run capacitors and start capacitors, 110, 130. The voltage to which a capacitor is subjected is not line voltage, but is a much higher potential, often called electromotive force or EMF, which is generated in the start winding. On a typical 230 volt motor, the generated voltage may be as high as 450 volts and is determined by the start winding characteristics, the compressor speed and the applied voltage. Good stuff right there. Okay, next paragraph. Capacitors, either start or run can be connected either in series or parallel to provide the desired characteristics if the voltage and the MFD are properly selected. All right, so they can be in series. When two capacitors having the same MFD rating are, are connected in series, the resulting total capacitance will be one half the rating capacitance of the single. Now that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Okay, it doesn't make common sense. So we just gotta make sure that we understand that. When you put capacitors in series, it's actually half. The actual total capacitance goes down. The formula for de determining capacitance when capacitors are connected in series is follows. So whatever the MFD is, you put one over it, all right? One over the MFD, and then you add them together. All right, so here's what you do. Let's say you have a 20 MFD rated capacitor and a 30 MFD rated capacitor, okay? They're connected in series. So here's what we do. We have one over 20 plus one over 30, all right? So what we do is we have to find the lowest common denominator. Do you remember that from junior high math? All right. 
So it's one over, so that would be three over 60 plus two over 60. They don't really show you that extra step there, but that's what they're doing. They're finding the low and commas denominator. You can, um, so one over, so that, that makes it, like I said, three over 60 plus two over 60 equals five over 60, which is one over 12. So the final answer is when a 20 MFD and a 30 MFD are wired in series, the actual total MFD is 12. Okay, so whether or not that makes sense to you or not, I don't know, but we'll get it right on test day. So as we go down in that section, now that you know, we talked, now that was in series. So now we're talking about in parallel. Um, this is the second to last paragraph in that section. Uh, when capacitors are connected in parallel, their MFD rating is equal to the sum of the individual ratings. The voltage rating is equal to the smallest rating of the, the voltage rating. Okay, so the capacitor, capacitor rating is measured in MFD. And then the voltage rating, it says, is equal to the smallest rating of the individual capacitors. So be careful about that if they ask for the voltage rating or the capacitor rating. Okay, so splitting hairs there. Is po it is possible to use any combination of single series or parallel starting capacitors with single or parallel running capacitors? All right, interesting. Uh, do dual voltage and three phase motors. I think it's worth taking a look at this. Certain Copeland three phase motors are wound with two identical stator windings, which are connected in parallel. All right, on a 208 or 220 volt operation. And in series for a 440, 480 volt operation. Internal connections of this type of motor are shown in figures eight and 8A. Okay. These models have two separate windings with nine leads, which must be connected correctly for the voltage of power supply. If the windings are connected out of phase, or if the jumper bars are not positioned correctly, motor overheating and possible failure will occur. Okay, let's look at fuses and circuit breakers. I think this is worth taking a look at here. Um, air conditioners, uh, motor compressors, and PSC motors, it is possible that nuisance tripping of household type circuit breakers may occur. PSC motors have very low starting torque, and if pressures are not equalized at startup, the motor may require several seconds to start and accelerate. This is most apt to occur where a short cycle of the compressor can be caused by the thermostat making current contact prematurely due to the shock or vibration. Typically, this can occur when the thermostat is wall mounted and can be jarred by slamming of a door. All right. UL and most electrical inspection agencies now require that hermet hermetic type refrigeration motors, compressors must comply with NEC, National Electric Code Maximum Fuse Sizing Requirement. This establishes the maximum fuse size at 225% of the motor full load current. And by definition, the motor compressor nameplate amperage is considered full load current, unless this rating is superseded by another on the unit nameplate. Since the motor protector may take up to 17 seconds to trip if the compressor fails to start, it is possible that a standard type fuse or circuit breaker sized on the basis of 225% may break the circuit prior to the compressor protector trip. Since locked rotor current of the motor may be from 400 to 500% of the nameplate average. To avoid nuisance stripping, Copeland recommends that air conditioners with PSC motors be installed with branch circuit fuses or circuit breakers sized as closely as possible to the 225 maximum limit and fuse the circuit breaker to be of the time delay type with a capability of withstanding motor locked rotor current for a minimum of 17 seconds. Okay, all right, we'll, we'll buy that. Um, and we have lots more wiring diagrams that uh, we don't spend a lot of time in. 
And um, the next thing that I have is the safety procedures. We talked about the safety procedures in the, um, in the introduction, but if it's okay, I'll go ahead and do those again. Once again, on 427, you have danger, warning, caution, safety instructions. You've got definitions there. You know, they, they may seem like they're very similar, but on test day, you may have to uh, uh, just make a distinction. Uh, on the next page, uh, 428, use of cranes. Don't use them under power lines, they tell us. That's always a good plan. All right, 430, leak testing procedures with regard to safety. Okay, what you do not do. There's a lot of do nots there. Okay, so make sure you can find oxygen and oil combined to cause an explosion. Okay, uh, don't use oxygen in a, in a, in a refrigeration. So refrigerants, uh, you know, don't enter an enclosed area after a refrigerant leak, okay, without ventilating. Okay, you gotta use the buddy system and so forth. Okay. Um, safety procedures with regard to refrigeration. And then once again, electrical on page 435, um, you're not gonna take those handheld, and you're not gonna take high voltage measurements and they, they, just, they discuss those as 600 volts or more with your handheld instruments. Okay, page 438, troubleshooting charts. Um, once again, in the intro, we did this, but I think it's worth taking, you know, just, just kind of reiterating this. You have all the different types of appliances on page 438. Um, there they are all listed. Okay, so the troubleshooting chart is divided into your type of appliance. So first of all, you got to figure out which appliance you're looking at. And then they, they, they tell you that at the top of the page, at the top of each page, which appliance you're in. And then you've got the condition on the left-hand column what can cause it, what you can, how you can fix it, and then the reference page. So you might wanna be able to find, uh, to find the troubleshooting chart. Um, and if they wanna know what the cause is and you find that there are more than one choice that are on the exam that are in the possible cause, what I would suggest is use the one that's higher up in the chart. For instance, on if the unit will not run and they have blown fuse and burn transformer as possible, you're going to choose blown fuse because it's probably more common that there's a blown fuse and a burn transformer. You're going to check the fuse first. That's what I mean by that. So once again, terrific index in this book. Hopefully it'll get you there where you need to be if uh, if you um if you use the index and, and, uh, and, and, you know, check the, you know, the keyword or the key concept, you look in the index, you find where it's at and you go from there and pass this exam and go on with the rest of your life. All right. Real good. That is the air conditioning and refrigeration troubleshooting handbook, pretty much page for page.